I can go to every country in the world. Like I could figure out how to get this car into North Korea. Would you do that? Why not? What made you decide to sell your house, buy a Lamborghini Urus and live in it? At some point I was like, what am I working for? I started getting rid of like a few things and it felt really good. And next thing you know, I was on the ground on a yoga mat in my living room bidding on a Lamborghini. Leipzig, Romania, Italy. I've showered in glacial waterfalls, rivers, creeks, lakes, car washes. Those are great. I get some good eyeballs when I'm doing that. Is this all just like a new thing? I had a buddy of mine. He had spent all of his money. I grilled him and I was like, you need to save for the future. And then Saturday came along and he was done. He hit a cow on the ride home and was dead. Everyone that said, someday I'm going to retire. Someday I'm going to do a trip here. Fuck someday. Do it today. 98% of the time it's positive, but you're going to get the 2% negative. There was a experience in Romania. His wife saw that I had the lapel microphone still clipped on and they thought I was some sort of spy. They were like, get the F out, leave our country right away. Yet you're deciding to either take it through Africa or Asia. Which one do you think you're going to end up choosing? You have to wait and find out. <laughs> Connor, the listeners and I would like to understand how you've taken the saying, you can live in a car, but you can't race a house quite so literally. But in your own words, who are you and what have you done? Well, my name's Connor and I currently am homeless, living in the back of my Lamborghini Urus that I've converted into a camper overland rig, traveling around the world, currently in Europe, but have plans to go down to Africa, through Asia and South America and other islands and places in between. And when you say homeless, if you'd like to show everybody the board that you've brought along, you are quite literally homeless. <laughs> and I genuinely mean this is going to be a fantastic episode, I hope, because there's so many questions that I've never been able to ask anybody else about this kind of stuff because nobody else has done it. You are living in a Lamborghini, something that so many people would say isn't possible. And this morning, I was literally sat underneath your awning <laughs> to the side of the Euros. And you were making me pancakes before the show that we're currently at. If you can hear a slight bit of background noise in this episode, we are at Petrol Hedonism Underground at Wembley. There is literally thousands of people outside the van, but we're using its soundproof capabilities to be able to record this episode. So you've taken this whole minimal living thing to the next level. What made you decide to sell your house, buy a Lamborghini Urus and live in it? Well, I saw the screw that was loose over here, and I think it must have been mine because <laughs> that's probably something of it. <laughs> but uh, in all reality, I just had spent the last 12 years working away, 18-hour days, and I just had this burning desire to do something different, to travel. And it stemmed from years ago, I had a buddy of mine who I talked to him on a Thursday afternoon and he had gone down to Arizona, he was in school, and he was heading back. And we talked about how he's gonna come back, he's gonna be there Monday, he wanted a job, I had a construction company at the time, and he had spent all of his money for the entire school year just having fun and living it up. And I grilled him and I was like, man, you should not have blown all your money, you need to save for the future, invest. And then Saturday came along and he was done. He hit a cow on the ride home and was dead. And that made you think? And it it didn't right away, but for years it just like the thought, the thought was there. You know, there would be something I was doing that I would have invited him to or something I was saying that would have reminded me of him. And I was thinking like, this is so weird. Someone that's, you know, my age just is disappeared. Like. It's so weird when someone dies, they're just, they're gone. And that always was in my mind of like, life is short. We only have one life on this planet. And sure, I could continue working and building my real estate empire and have 40 Lamborghinis, but what am I gonna be 80 years old where I can't even like tell the difference between the pedals? So I was like, no, I have one life right now. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Let's go today, travel around the world and do it in a Lambo. So that love of cars must have come from somewhere when you were younger to decide 
to do that. And I understand how profound it is that when something like that happens, almost like a big life moment, that it can really change the way you think. But growing up, what were the kind of things around you? What was your family like? And why are you into cars? Because you obviously got to be into cars to think that I'm going to live in a Lamborghini. So kind of paint us that picture so that we can understand where the craziness has come from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting. My first vehicle was a Ford F-350 crew cab, long bed, diesel pickup truck that, you know, I would cut holes in the bed and I installed a smokestack and things like that. And it was a total piece of junk. It was half the price of everything else on Craigslist. The engine dripped about a gallon of oil a week. The transmission would smoke if you went up a big hill and the hitch had been like ripped out and was welded back in at an angle that was sketchy at best. And that was my start into the you know automotive world. So just being in this vehicle that you're nervous about, like whether you can even get from A to B, but I used that truck to make money. You know, I did everything that I could, whether it was mowing lawns or snow shoveling or handyman work and eventually got into construction and, you know, building houses and <clears throat> later into commercial real estate. But after that truck, it was so unreliable that I thought, you know what? I don't have the money to buy a new vehicle, but I was driving down this farm road one day and saw this old 1980 F-250 for sale on the side of the road for 1200 bucks. And I was like, you know, let me buy that. I'll fix everything up instead of like the piecemeal like I've done, you know, my first truck, I was friends with the guys at the auto parts store because I was there every day buying parts. And with that truck, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna buy all the parts. They're cheap, they're old, and just completely build myself what is like a new truck out of an old chassis. So I spent a few months building that thing out and that was the more reliable vehicle between the two that I would go around and do work in. But not a camper van in any way, not shape, or Not a camper van, form. not yet. So was your first camper van a Lamborghini? Mm. Or did you like to go away? Because what I'm trying to do is piece yeah. together the bits that's kind of compiled to where you are today, right. living in a Lamborghini camper van. Like when you were younger, We've obviously figured out that to have what you've got, you had to have some skills to be able to put it together and actually make it, which you've done yourself, right? Yeah. With a bit of help from friends here and there. But when you're out on your own, you've got to have those skills. But when you were younger, did you used to go out? Did you used to like exploring or is this all just like a new thing? So <clears throat> in 2016, I did my first ever solo abroad trip and I rented an Audi Q3. And I was driving from Switzerland up through uh, France and into Germany and around Europe. And there was one night I was like, I don't have a hotel planned, but why do I need to have a hotel planned? What if I just camp in the car? So I went to a Swiss Army surplus store, bought a mattress, the blow up, blew, blew it up off the air vent and bought a sleeping bag. And I camped in the back of that. And I was like, oh, this is really freeing because you can go literally anywhere, blend in, camp. You don't have to deal with the hassle of finding a hotel or an Airbnb or a hostel. I can just go wherever I want, whenever I'm tired, camp right there. And that was what sparked both my travel desire and camping, living in the back of a vehicle. But I think the bit that would be the biggest barrier for me is even once you've got that kind of flair that you want to do that you mentioned that you're in commercial real estate we we joke about the fact that you've got a homeless lamborghini board there but you are have got a lamborghini which not many people can say in this world you've obviously had a successful career leading up to that but people with successful careers also tend to have a lot of things tying them down it's got to be a very very small percentage of people that would actually be able to do that so what has compiled to actually allow you to just go off on your own on this crazy adventure. Like what does life look like at home? So <clears throat> the, I guess the last few years leading up to this, obviously I was interested in travel, you know, from that experience going abroad. And I had built a house for myself, garden, everything the way I liked it, like completely organized kitchen, bathroom, I and mean, everything built from scratch the way I like it. And I had a girlfriend for a few years and we lived together. And it was like essentially like the start of what would be a family. 
and we grew apart. The American dream. Up. The American dream. I didn't have the white picket fence, but you know. <laughs> and we grew apart and broke up. And after that, I was like excited at first, but then really sad. And what did I know how to do? Just work. So I just dug in and just worked, worked, worked even harder than I was working before. And she already complained that I had worked too much. <laughs> and at some point I was like, what am I working for? Like if I'm just constantly working, where's the end? You know, sure. There's this like retirement goal, this dream, but you know, I had collected so much stuff, like a house full of stuff. And then in construction, when you, you grow up from, you know, nothing in construction, you do a project, you have extra insulation lying around after a project, you store it, you store it here, you store it there. Next thing you know, I had all these clients I'm working for, like they have little storage rooms and I've got like construction materials stored there to use it for another project. I'm keeping track of it. And I just had so much belongings. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna start thinning out like de-hoarding and just go minimalist lifestyle, just completely like bare minimum what I need. And I started getting rid of like a few things, some tools, and it felt really good. And I started getting rid of like more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. And next thing you know, I was on the ground on a yoga mat in my living room bidding on a Lamborghini. And remember, if you need help with your digital marketing services, get in touch with my agency, Tweak. We offer everything you could possibly need to help accelerate your business to the next level. And is that your first Lamborghini? Yeah. Most people's first Lamborghini, they have this idea that they'll probably be polishing it, keeping it really nice, taking it to shows, taking it out on a Sunday to the pub or maybe to a car meet in the evening with their mates. Yours looks very different upstairs amongst the show cars here. It's absolutely filthy. It is missing one of its wheel archer trims. You've put huge off-road tyres on it as well as many other different modifications. Do you want to kind of paint a picture for our listeners of what you've done to your Lamborghini Urus to make it the way it is now for you to go off traveling in it around the world. So when I first bought it and drove it home, I, I, I bought it on an auction site, bring a trailer from California, picked it up in Vegas for tax reasons, and then drove it back to Colorado. And I picked the car up and the entire drive home, I was just like, sweating palms what did i just do this is the biggest mistake the most money i've ever spent in my life like i, I was freaking out and i'm guessing because of what you've done to it you just pay cash for the car because you, you kind of yeah. need to when you're chopping it up yeah yeah and that was like the most nervous drive home i actually went like fairly slow the whole drive it, it was such a weird surreal feeling and I got it back and I was like, no, I'm committing to this. I'm doing this. So I built out the first version out of wood on the interior and then figured out the layout and moved some things around and rebuilt the whole thing out of aluminum. And it was a mad rush because I was trying to get it to Europe to start traveling around the world. So the night before I had to drive it to LA to drop it off at the airport to clear customs, I was like welding it at my buddy's house. And it was like 11 o'clock at night hit the road, I think by like midnight, haul ass to LA, drop the car off, and we were able to put it on an airplane and fly it to Europe. And I actually got permission from LAX to get into the airport to film the car going on the plane, which was a whole set of- uh, Which you've done very work. well there because airport rules in the US are usually the strictest anywhere in the world. So you have seriously done very well there. And just casually talking about how you're flying your Lamborghini over to Europe to go off doing things in it. But then the contrast of the night before welding it. Like who's who could else can say I welded my Lamborghini? Like it's just not what you hear. But I remember when the Urus was actually launched. It was lucky enough that when I was um, growing up, we had our business. My dad had a Urus um, for a bit, a black one. So I've driven one. Really impressive car. Um, obviously a Lamborghini. You can see that when you look at it. Everybody wanted one because it's the first ever Lamborghini SUV. What made you choose a Urus for this trip though? Was there other things on the card? What made you think, so I need a camper van to travel around the country. Why a Lamborghini? Well, I like the Audi platform and a lot of people out there are like, oh, it's an Audi, it's a Volkswagen. And like, it has the foundation of that, but then it's a Lambo. It has the experience of a Lambo and it's just, it's just awesome. I mean, when I got into this, you know, I wasn't 
like a fanatic of Lamborghini. I actually was more into Ferraris before I set off into this journey. I always wanted an F430 or a 360 or a 488 if that was even, you know, a realistic expectation. And when I got the Lambo, it was for all right, this is an SUV. It's going to be fun. It's fast. And it's going to be crazy popping off on YouTube because I thought at the time I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to quit construction. I'm going to get some income from YouTube. If I buy a Lambo, that's like the key to success. Like all of a sudden you're just going to pop off. And I bought the thing. And then I realized videos are hard to make. Lamborghini in 2023 doesn't pop off on YouTube like it did in, you know, 2018. So, you know, it's quite the, the struggle, but it's still a Lambo. And the biggest thing that I figured out about it is when you go to these dealerships around the world, whether it's to stop in, get a key changed, a battery key or some service or anything, it's an experience. And you go to these dealerships and it's just, it's fun at every single one you go to. It's a complete party. Everyone loves what I'm doing with the car. They think it's absolutely mad, but it's just like, it's such a awesome experience beyond what you get with any other car manufacturer. So let's just simple it down for a minute. When you open the boot of a Urus, which most people can picture, you sleep on the left-hand side of the car. The rear seats are folded down. You've got the bench where you seat, where you sleep. And what I was surprised about earlier is there's me last night staying in the Hilton around the corner from here in plush bed, nice mattress. You know, what I consider to be just a nice night's sleep. You are sleeping on a mattress that thin, just a few millimeters thin on top of an aluminium plate. That was the first thing that I noticed, but obviously because of space. You've then got drawers underneath that. On the right hand side, you've got boxes of storage, all very organized. And then on the rear passenger seat on the other side, you've got more boxes of storage, all labeled with exactly what it is. And then the rest of the storage is on the roof where you've got kind of hardcore, is it? sort of boxes plastic boxes with clips on the roof and you keep boots i saw a fishing rod up there and all kinds of other bits and bobs that's kind of how the car is right sat on its off-road tires able to go everywhere and a spare tire on the roof yep do you ever struggle with storage and but you mentioned that you've stripped everything back to the bare essentials and even though a urus is the most space of any lamborghini it's still not a van it's still not like a huge space have you struggled at all or has it been absolutely sublime yeah, I mean, there's definitely been a struggle there. The first thing I did was rip out the subwoofer right out of the back to install the batteries. I actually have 300 amp hour batteries for my electronic system that's under the fridge. And the space has been difficult. I mean, when I first set off on this journey, I was doing it with a videographer who was traveling in the car as oh. well. So he had all of his gear in addition to me having all of my gear. In fact, I've been running around with my ski boots for the last like eight or nine months and I've yet to ski a day. <laughs> so I don't need all the gear perhaps. I couldn't believe just how well you've put everything together in the back of that car. But we must get back to, your car was being loaded onto a plane at LAX. They let you record it, which means it was obviously going somewhere. He said going to Europe. Do you want to list some of the places that you've actually been in your Lamborghini? So I flew it into Leipzig. And the first thing I had to do was get new tires because they were pretty bald to drive on the Autobahn, which of course is like the dream as an American. You bring your car to Europe and you drive it out, you know, on the Autobahn. And I took it down to Romania. I did a barbecue in front of Andrew Tate's house till his security. I was going to camp there, but his security, you know, kicked me out. So that was a thing. And then I did the whole original roof rack in Romania. And now we've changed it for the front runner rack and went down to Italy, Coliseum, camped on the beach in Italy, the mountains in Romania, drove Trans Shan, which Jeremy Clarkson says is the world's most beautiful road. And a lot of this has just been getting ready for taking it around the world, you know, this bouncing around from site to site, obviously. So this is the warm up. Yeah. Yeah. This is the warm up. Like I haven't even gotten started. I mean, you know, I did the Nürburgring with Misha. That was sketchy. <laughs> it was rainy and he just doesn't hold back, does he? On that thing. I was oof. so I'm actually working with Misha and Vulcan Alpha, his new engineering firm right now, to do front and rear bumpers and skid plates and all that. So once that's done, which hopefully we can get it done in the next like couple of weeks, I'm hoping to really just enjoy the European summer for what it is. 
before trekking off. And I'm deciding whether I'm going down through Africa or across through Asia, but that's where the real journey begins. And on that journey so far, you've clocked up how many kilometers? I would say like 30,000, give or take. Okay, and how many more then before? 500,000. Really? Yeah, I mean, I wanna do all of the world. So to do this, your business before was construction. Yeah. When I was doing the research for the episode, some of the videos that I found on what you do were slightly more unorthodox as a type of construction. It was like whistling diesel meets property development, uh, rather different to what I expected for say, but you had a pretty successful career in property then. So did you literally sell up your businesses, your real estate, everything? And are like working down the funds in this pot traveling around the world like how are you managing to do that sure so and that's everyone's question they find me in the parking lot what's your advice what do you do for a living you know i live in a car homeless that's my job but in they all must reality think you're joking yeah yeah some people do some people do but when i set off on this journey i was actually going to try to run my construction company remotely and manage the content and my rentals and after a little while, I was like, all right, it's not gonna be realistic to run the construction company. And then in the last month, I've been like, all right, you know what, it's time to just, there's been just random things that have been popping up that are just flukes. And I see it as like a sign of just release from all of the burdens of life. And it's, as you said earlier in the episode, I have no wife, no kids, nothing holding me down. Like this is the opportunity I have to travel around the world. So I'm selling all of my rentals and I'm just gonna be traveling around the world for the next few years, focusing on enjoying life and living in the car. Now to many people, if they've got a pot of cash for say, so you've built, built up this business, built up the rentals that you've had, built up equity in them for say, and you're selling them and then getting some money and traveling around the world, and then like selling another one, getting some money and going somewhere else. I've heard Mr. B say before on his channel that he's pretty confident that he could just start a new YouTube channel, but it not be him, be someone totally unknown. And within a couple of months, be on a million subscribers, be doing a million views a video because he just understands YouTube so well. Do you have like, because we all have a level of wanting to keep ourselves secure and a security in what we know. Do you have like this thing in your mind? It's just like, wait, well, when, I, when I'm done, I'll just sort of head back and do it again. Is, is that the way you look at it? Or are you just totally focused in the moment? So, I mean, I've spent my entire life planning for a future, right? And it's, it's, I had a teacher in school and he said that the road to hell is, you know, what's the saying? I'm stumbling on it. It is immediate gratification is the road to financial hell. And that saying just like was pressed into me that as soon as, I mean, before I even graduated high school, I would skip days and snow blow at 4 a.m. in the morning to make money. But I had this work ethic of like build future, build future, build future, buy rentals, you know, get cash flow. And now I'm like, you know what? I have this possibility, this few years of time before, you know, I'm ready to have kids and a wife and all that where I can just totally be free. And can you cuss on here? <laughs> Yeah. And just fuck off for a few <laughs> years, which is like the dream that everyone has is just to fuck off for a few years. And fortunately, I get to do it, you know, in a Lambo traveling around. I don't know, because it's a it's a really strange one. My thing is when I go somewhere and I'm there and I'm in the moment, I really enjoy it and get excited by it. And like we went to SEMA, we went to Vegas and I just thought I could just stay here. I didn't get that feeling of really wanting to come home. I was just loving it but it was because I was with a huge group of my friends. Now, my friends are like a really close family to me, basically. And if I did something like that, I would definitely get withdrawal symptoms of not only my small sausage dog, but also my mates and my mum. Like, leaving everything behind, do you still pop back and visit? Or are you very good at just being a solitary lone wolf sat on a beach, enjoying your own company? Or does it ever drive you a little bit crazy when you're out? on your own for so long? That's an interesting question. And there's definitely moments, you know, where I really like being totally alone and just in the wilderness and just feeling nature and walking around barefoot, shirtless, sometimes fully nude if no one's around and just in embracing, you know, what is this beautiful planet? But there's other moments where it's, it's very lonely, you know, and it's like, all right, like I have not my friends here. I have not family. In fact, 
I dropped the car off at Misha's shop while they were working on it and went down to Tunisia for a few weeks. And while I was there, they had this little girl who was, I don't know, 11 years old. And she wanted every day, she was like, come, come play with me, like Legos or a game or something. And I was like busy working because I'm still working to close my stuff in the US. You know, I've been working like every day for the last nine months, at least eight hours a day, just fixing things in the US. And that's what's pushed me to the point of like, just sell it, move on and focus 100% energy on making videos, enjoying traveling around in the Lambo. But with this girl, eventually she, I was getting asked every day, like, come on, come on, come on. And I was like, all right, let me take a break for some work and go play with this girl. And we played Legos and this other little color game. I don't even know what it was. And the smile on her face was like, and that energy was just unreal, you know, from being very lonely and like traveling around the last few months to like seeing how excited this little girl was and like how good I felt like being around someone that's just so enjoying the moment and like enjoying my company and her whole family was so nice and the same with them. And it was it was like, all right, like I need to not just be stuck up in the forest going, turning into a madman. You know, I need to go play volleyball, go meet people and adventure along this journey with friends. It's almost like being a professional at your hobby because even dull it down to something so crazy and off topic, but if somebody games, they play Call of Duty for argument's sake. There's the people that can just kind of hop on and then there's the people that could get the most out of it, the most out of the game, you know, every weapon was changing that week. And it's no different really with going off around the world on your own sort of traveling because you're either going to be someone that kind of straight lines into here, there, sees a tourist spot, sees that, or he's someone that learns to develop a certain way of thinking and a certain skill set to actually allow them to see and absorb more and have more experiences, to have a more like enriched journey when they're going around the world. So obviously you've met some people, you've met some great people, some positive people, just like that girl. But when you're traveling around, I know this firsthand experience in a, in a supercar, 98% of the time it's positive, but you're gonna get the 2% negative. On your journey, what have, what have you come across that's maybe scared you a little bit? There's definitely been like some threats. Yeah, there was a experience in Romania where I was told to leave the country by a guy. And that was a bit uh, disheartening. What, what had you done? So we had gone to, he had a club. And we were recording a car meet that day. And we had rolled up at the club and this guy, I don't know. If he's above board with all his business or not, that's not for me to say. And we had been at the car meet all night, so I had a microphone on at the car meet. We went to the club afterwards, talking with him. He's a bit drunk, pulls me aside, talks about nothing important. And at the end of the night, we were leaving and his, saw, his wife saw that I had the lapel microphone still clipped on and it wasn't even hooked up to the camera at all. And they thought I was like some sort of spy or something. I don't know. And they were, they were like, get the F out. Like, leave our country, leave this city, like, right away. And I was like, oh, shit. And I, I'd made some buddies. Like, when I was in this city in Romania, I'd actually made a bunch of friends. And they were there, too. And they were like, relax, the dude's drunk. Like, it's not that big of a deal. And I'm like, the guy, like, runs the town. <laughs> Whether he's drunk or not. Like. I can go anywhere in the world right now. I'd rather not be here. Yeah, right. Right. And so that was a bit sketchy, dodgy, if you will. And, you know, I mean, that's part of it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this in a vehicle that blends in. I'm doing this have in you a vehicle that's... Worried you're going to have it stolen or taken off of you or anything like that? You're literally in a high powered luxury vehicle going to all kinds of places. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a very real risk. And, you know, there's some times that I want to go in a city and explore. And it's difficult to do that. It, it's it's funny because you ask of like the dream is driving the Lambo and traveling around the world. Right. But you don't think about can you go to Paris? Can you go to London? Where are you going to put the car to walk around? You know, luckily, I've been able to find some like exotic hotels where I can valet it and leave the car there and go walk around, which is nice. 
and then it's being photographed all day long so it's you know somewhat safe so last night for example when I was in my very plush bed at the Hilton around the corner. Which I don't know why you're not sleeping in here. Like, this is pretty <laughs> comfortable. <laughs> Were you literally sleeping in the car at the yeah. car park here? Yeah. And no one questions that. No security comes over and says, you're right, mate. Like, what, what's going on? Are you there, like, with the camping gear set up outside, just, like, cooking dinner and stuff? I had a steak, yeah, that I cooked up last night. And then I just slipped into the car and went to bed and nobody said anything. And where's the most mental place you've ever stayed? Mental in which way? Expe the mental. unexpected? Okay. The two most memorable places I've stayed so far, uh, there are three, there's three that are the most memorable so far. One was I camped at a monument in Budapest in Hungary. And it turned out that the monument was the hero's square. And I, parked like at the side of this monument and i got the at 4 a.m in the morning and it was an irate police officer so pissed that i was camping right there and i wasn't in the monument i was like on the side but that was uh not the best of experiences he saw it as a sign of disrespect i wasn't meaning any disrespect and that was a little bit dodgy so you flew your car over to Europe, though, from yep. America. Yeah. I've obviously looked, and you know, I looked at how much it would cost to, say, ship this van to the States in a shipping container for argument's sake. Was that also a big chunk of the budget when looking to do stuff like this, is how you actually get the car around, like A to B? What was the quote on your van shipping? Uh, my quote was about $6,000 there and back, I believe. There and back? It could have been each way. I, think I can't probably remember. Each way, probably yeah. each way. Yeah. With insurance. I don't yeah. know. So that's the other thing that's been... Oh, yes. Of course it is. Insurance. How do you sort that? I have liability insurance. That's it. No comprehensive. If oh. something happens with the car... Game over. Yeah. So that's a risk that I live with every day. It's very stressful driving that car and wanting to have fun, but balancing it with going places that I don't want it to get stolen, going places that I don't want to crash it, not driving it you know, too crazy because I want to continue the journey with the car, not with you know, a horse. Yet you're deciding to either take it through Africa or Asia. Which one do you think you're going to end up choosing? You have to wait and find out. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hypothetically say you take it to Africa. How are you then going to... So, so how would you go about that? You've got your Lamborghini Urus here in the car park. Say, right, next week, Journey Africa begins. How do you begin to plan that and get on with it and go? So there's two ways to go about it, right? The one way is what I was thinking originally, which is just to just go. Just go down to Morocco and just start driving south and figure out visas and car documents as I go along and make my way down through Nigeria and other places and hopefully survive with the car to make it to South Africa and back. But the other idea is to do it in a convoy, to get a group of guys together that want to go overlanding across Africa all the way down. So it's going to be, you know, other affluent business people that are in that position to fuck off in life and want to do it, you know, in a convoy to be secure. And then you got to mesh with their personalities and is everything going to get along and all that or i guess the third option is just getting security going through some of these countries oh is that a real option to do something that's an like option that? too yeah i mean in america you drive around you know you carry your sig on your hip you got you know an ar-15 in the back seat like of course you do yeah yeah it's easy in fact i did a video i don't know if i ever even posted it where i was sleeping in the back of the car and to start it up when it's cold in the morning i took an ar-15 and pushed the brake pedal as my start stick and push the uh, the starter. <laughs> <laughs> but you must, so, so when you're going around in the car, I, I am, well, this is half of me because I'm the least engineering capable person you will ever meet in your entire life. I literally can't even take the wheel off the car <laughs> or change it. Has the Lambo been practical for your entire journey? 
So far, yes. And before I go off through Africa or Asia, I'm going to go through the car and replace things that could be an issue. Like they're known to have some issues with the alternators. And I'll probably just go ahead, like replace the alternator, replace the starter, replace the motors. You know, you, you have to treat it like an airplane, right? If you're at 40,000 feet, you can't afford for anything to fail because, you know, so the same thing. If I'm in the middle of Africa, like trying to get parts for that, gonna be very difficult. So I want to replace any of like the major wear items that potentially are going to like be a stopper for the journey, but things will come up. That's what's great content, but also very stressful. <laughs> what did your friends think of this idea when you told them back home? You mentioned how you reacted to that yeah. friend right at the beginning of the podcast. What do your current friends think? They think you're crazy. Yeah, mostly, mostly. I would say there's a few that are like, all right, I kind of understand. Like the ones that are, are still dreaming of like doing, you know, exotic car stuff are like, that's freaking epic. But then other friends are like, that's crazy. Or like, I have a lot of bougie friends too. And they're like, that's very uncomfortable. Like, why would you want to sleep on a metal tray and travel around and like- Have you ever got fed up with that and gone and got a hotel? Occasionally, yeah. So that does happen. Yeah. yeah. And where do you like shower and go and all that kind of stuff? So I've showered in glacial waterfalls, um, rivers, creeks, lakes, car washes. Those are great because they're almost in every city and you can just get sprayed down at the car wash. I get some good eyeballs when I'm doing that. Yeah. You literally don't care, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I do like to keep clean. So, you know, it is nice because you can wash the car. You can wash I have yourself. a shower at my hotel room if you need <laughs> Round the corner. Thank you for the offer. So you mentioned you've got no insurance, just liability cover. And you let Misha, who is 11 tenths on any day that he's going around the track, behind the wheel of your Lamborghini camper van. What tires was it on when you went around the Nürburgring? Oh, like bald not bald but like racing summer slicks how did that all come about because you've obviously been making content um online and and posting on instagram and making some videos on youtube about what you've been doing traveling around in the camper game i mean why wouldn't you it's something so unique but it's still very hard to get in touch sometimes with some of those guys because they've got so many offers to make great content and all the rest of it how did meeting misha and actually getting him to take your lambo for a lap around the ring all come about because he's now actually working through his other company to make parts to even improve the car based off the back of that stuff. So Misha's an interesting cookie, I think, compared to a lot of you know YouTubers that I've met or experienced or seen in that he mostly does. Now he's got a bit of a crew, but before like he did everything himself. So I had sent him a DM and he personally had responded to that DM. And I know that he's, you know, flooded with DMs. That's what he did to me when I asked to come on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, he's good. And he's just, he's on the ball. And I've, you know, I've been there at his place, like at the Vulcan and like before when he was um, across the street there and seen how he operates. And like, we've gone to the gym at midnight and that's how he operates. I mean, I don't know when he sleeps. I, I don't know if he sleeps, he may be a zombie, <laughs> but he works so freaking hard. I mean, when I was there at Vulcan, I had camped outside and he left at like midnight, no, 1130 at night to go home and eat. We met at the gym at 12 like leave the gym at one, he goes home. The next morning he shows up cause he's like picking up a card from a time-lapse that was recording at like 7 20 a.m like that dude's just he is he's on the ball he is he is a hard worker like what you see on the screen he's putting out a video every single day which from my i struggle for me to even get a video out after like months of filming he's putting a video out every single day now on two channels and on instagram yeah i, I don't know how he does it. he's a busy guy these guys get into kind of routines where they're able to just, it's just like rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. They almost don't even need to think about what they're doing. And they have kind of limited variables. It's like Misha when he's doing his track videos. The only thing that really changes is the car that he's driving every time the cameras go in the same position and it's kind of rinse and repeat. Whereas a bit harder 
with with what you're doing because you never know what's going to come up but then that is the excitement in the journey i was thinking a video i'd i'd love to see although it wouldn't be ideal for you is i'm a massive fan of problem solving i love a good problem solving you must have come across some situations especially if you're driving out to beaches or across creeks or rocks or all the rest of it have you ever got stuck on your own in that car yeah, so actually when I was in the States, before I left, I met up with one of my buddies in Durango and we went off-roading with it and high-centered on the snow. And luckily I had my sat phone with me and we called his friend and he brought a Toyota and pulled us out. So you do have a satellite phone? <laughs> yeah. And do you have, do you use like <clears throat> Elon's network for... So that's an interesting thing. Yeah, and that's what's another thing, speaking of the content creation that's difficult, is I don't have a stable internet connection and I'm in one country one day, another country the next, different phone cards and plans. And for a while there I had a Starlink and the Starlink is an amazing product. I have it mounted in a company's carcass that is very unreliable and I haven't had internet for the last couple months. I've been writing the company but they haven't responded. So, you, so how does that work? You have to mount, explain. Okay, so I took the Starlink from Elon Musk, genius, and cut the thing open with an angle grinder and set it into this mounting apparatus that goes on the roof and then plugs into all of my systems. So when it works, which is rare, it gives me Wi-Fi everywhere I go. I mean, in fact, when I was in the mountains of Romania, everyone around had no internet, no phone, and I'm like posting videos live which is pretty epic to be in the middle of nowhere and have internet thanks to the Starlink. So I gotta get that sorted out. But like the last few weeks has just been so difficult because I'm moving, moving, moving. Like I can't, I can't post a video when I'm you know, racing around and then I get somewhere and it's like 1 a.m. and I'm like, I gotta go to bed. Mentally, could you do this trip in this day and age without internet access and go completely off grid? Because you've managed to remove yourself from having to live with your own company and sometimes the worst place you can actually be is just inside your own head for too long but would you be able to do this trip if you didn't have internet in this day and age it would be very difficult i have thought about doing a video with like an og motorola razor and like all right can i survive 24 hours or 72 hours with just like an atlas map and a motorola razor and like see how bad of a challenge that would be and i think it would be epically uncomfortable because i guess the only way you get to stay in touch with what's going on in the outside world is through your phone right are your parents still around and if so what do they think of what you're currently doing so yeah they are still around fortunately and my mom thinks i'm crazy and wants me to bring it back and just travel around the US. She says, oh, just bring it around the US. It's not a dangerous world out there. You know, you're closer to home, like, you know, the motherly aspect. And I told her, I'm like, I'm young. This is my time to travel the world. How old are you? 28. Wow, okay. And she's like, stay home. And my dad, he understands. You know, he, he, he gets along with it. And that's actually a question I have for you, is I know that your father had passed away. I'm very sorry to hear that. But what would be your message to either, I say kids like me, whatever, people like me, kids like me that want their fathers to come along on an adventure, but their fathers like to work too much or vice versa, fathers that want to go on adventures to their, with their sons and their sons work too much. I think you always write off the element of surprise with death. I think that people think um, that death is something that they almost plan for. Like that some of us joke like, oh, I'll be gone between 50 and 60 or I'll be gone between 70 and 80 based on their lifestyle. That's a bit like how you're saying about planning for the future. Um, where obviously what I learned from from my dad passing away from a heart attack suddenly was that there's the element of surprise with all the world. So the, the best time to plant a tree was either 20 years ago or tomorrow. Like it's, if you haven't done something yet, that's fine. And you can look back and be like, oh, it's irritating, we should have done that. But you've still got the opportunity to do it today or tomorrow. 
And I think that what happens with people is they get into such kind of routines and the way they are that they think they will do something, but they just won't. And what I kind of like, which is why you are different to the norm, is that you definitely don't sit in that that routine. And the amount of mental capacity that you've dedicated to be like, I will make this idea that I've got work, this thing that I want to do work traveling around, but it's going to take me to get rid of the business that I've built, to sell my house, to do all of those huge things to actually make it possible. Because when you embark on such a huge project like you've done, it obviously does become a lot of planning. It's like running a mini business. And I think other people don't necessarily have that thing in their brain that makes them do that. And it's hard. You asked me what message I would give to those people. I learned from my dad that you can't necessarily change or tell people to do something. If you can tell people to do something a hundred times, they still don't do it. Sometimes I think you kind of have to either physically drag them into the car or just accept that their life is a different path to the one that you're on. But I'm guessing from that question, you would like your dad to come along with you and he hasn't yet. So I would like him to join, you know, maybe not all the time, but to join for some adventure, some part of the driving, you know, he's getting older and he just work, 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 and is focusing on getting to that point where he can comfortably retire. And so he's like ramped up business and is just working away. And I see it like he's got all similar interests to what I have. And I think it would be an incredible thing to have him come along for some of the journey. And I've seen like Matt Armstrong working alongside his dad. And that's just like incredible to me. I I see that as just something super epic, you know, that they're into the same thing. And I think like that would be amazing to have my dad join me for some parts of the trip. And every time I talk with him about it, he's like, oh, well, your plan's all over the place and I'm busy. And, you know, that's just that, that's one of the things that I get so much with this trip and not just with, you know, him, but with everyone is they have this idea of like someday. And I had, I was surrounded by neighbors in suburbia with everyone that said, someday I'm going to retire. Someday I'm going to do a trip here. Someday I'm going to do this, that fuck someday, do it today. It may not be the most ideal opportunity. Like when I left on this trip, it was not the right time. I'm 28, have, you're in the prime of your business. Yeah. I'm in the prime of business. I have things going, things planned. I had, you know, employees and people counting on me and all of that, that I had to wind down. But at the same time, I was only going to have more responsibilities in the future, whether it's health related to God forbid, or having kids or wife or whatever that comes down the road, maybe even taking care of my parents and whatnot. There was no time like the present to make something happen. Why couldn't you then hand all that over to your dad if he does want to stay back? You've unlocked the code in your 20s, which a lot of people try and do, of real estate and property. And as you said, cash flow of those properties. There's obviously a lot to manage there. Was that not something that you could hand over almost in an opposite reverse family situation? Well, I mean, he's already working 18 hour days on his own business. So you know, doing anything in construction is not, is not in his okay. wheelhouse, but he's already, he's already on his you know path and he has employees and all that that are accounting on him. And, you know, I'll call him on the phone while I'm driving. I got to run. I got an employee calling. They got some issue or this or that. And so that's obviously where you get your business prowess from, but I was trying to find early and I can't seem to see it yet. Did you used to get like taken away on like trips to the mountains camping when you were a kid or all the rest of it it's like what you saw to spark this kind of like that's what i want to do i want to see the world moment like when was that eureka moment i think it really stemmed from that first solo trip abroad i mean they say once you get the travel bug it's like a it's a virus that you can't get rid of for life and i would say that's what stemmed it but always growing up my dad always worked, you know, a lot to provide for the family. And I always wanted to like go shoot guns. And it was like, occasionally I would go. So eventually when I got older, I just like signed myself up for the shooting team to go do it. 
And, you know, with camping, it was, or like boating or like anything, it was always something that I wanted to do, but it was either like not economically something we could do or a time wise because whatever. And that's where I've just rejiggered the way I'm living life, if you will. It's probably like a colloquial term that you guys don't have here, but like reconfigured would be a better English way to say it. The way I'm going about life and living a life of not having regrets and doing things that are enjoyable to do and explorative. I mean, but part of this journey for me is not just to go explore these places. I mean, phase one obviously is, is this exploring places, talent stacking, you know, learning of all the different things that I don't even know exist around different spots and about different foods and different cultures. And I would love to create videos. And what I'm planning on doing is creating videos on all of those things and learning stuff in these different regions. But the other part of it is I really like helping other people move into better spaces in their life. So that's the later phase of this trip. And that's my goal with the content is to inspire other people to say and, and viewers to not just live in this like stuck jail cell of some day that just it cuts deep so hard of the, the two biggest things that get on me is when people say like someday i'm going to do that and then next thing you know they've got like a life threatening thing and they can't or the other thing is they just accumulate massive amounts of stuff that they're tied down to like an anchor and after like getting rid of all of those burdens, it's so freeing to just be floating, you know, around, if you will, in a, in a way, the world. And do you plan on going places like India, like Australia, China, Russia? Where's the, where's the limits of where you think you could, where do you not think you could go? I mean, if there's a will, there's a way I can go to every country in the world. Like I could figure out how to get this car into North Korea. Would you do that? Yeah. Where's that screw gone? <laughs> <laughs> right here. This you is the loose screw that we found at the beginning of the podcast somewhere that's now fallen it, it, on the floor. It fell out of my head. must have fallen out of his head. You would take your Lamborghini, Campagini into North Korea. Yeah. Why not? I can't figure you out, man. <laughs> Have you seen the movie? <laughs> I feel like you're living it. Yeah, I mean, I want to take this car and I want to adventure everywhere around the world. So no whether limits. that's North Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan. It's a tiny question, but I have I have my one of my favorite things in my life is my dog. I absolutely love my dog as like a companion. They say that obviously dogs are they show endless amounts of love as long as you give them to them. Would you ever do this with a pet? Have you ever considered having a dog along the journey? So there was one little puppy in this field in Romania that I camped in. It was a sheep farm. And he came up to me and just like immediately we had like a bond and hung out for a few hours. And I thought about asking the sheep farmer if I could buy the dog from him. But I thought about it and I was like, then you're tied down to this pet. And if I need to drop the car off and fly somewhere, or this and that, I'm crossing borders. And there are people that overland around the world with their pets, with their kids, etc. But the more of these obligations you have, the more, the, the, the less mobility you have in your movement. And right now, the biggest thing for me, especially when I'm looking to get in and out of countries like Afghanistan or Albania or Iraq, is doing it quick and fast. And if you go, if you've ever traveled, you know, with your family or seen like a family traveling, it's always them that get targeted for pickpocketing and crime and all of that because they're moving slow and obvious. Whereas when I travel solo, I can move fast. If that makes sense. When you are moving and going to all these places, well, that does make sense. And it's a Lambo, so you know. It goes fast. And it's a lamb voice that goes fast. <laughs> but yeah, then it is very recognizable as well. Yeah. Do you think to yourself, what happens if I don't achieve this? 
Would you go stir crazy if you didn't make it to those countries? The way your mind works, are you now like, that's the idea, that's what I'm doing, I must achieve it? Like, not even a puppy that can give me happiness and companionship on this journey is getting in the way of me getting into Afghanistan with my Lamborghini. Is it more about the ticking the box of doing the thing than it actually is the enjoyment of it now? There is some fundamentals of that that would be true. And I would like to challenge that personally because I think that we should have happiness and enjoy all of the moments as we go along. But I think having the drive to go and do and accomplish things along the journey, such as going these places, is important to to push us to do things that may be what we're uncomfortable to do or not. But I definitely need to slow down more and enjoy the moments and not just tick the boxes. Well, I think some of your craziest moments, experiences, stories to tell will be coming once you've either chosen to go through Asia or Africa. So no doubt I will have to find you in the back of this van yet again at some point. We'll make sure we leave the links to your channels and your social media threads down below in the subscription. So if you want to follow Collar's journey around the world in his converted Lamborghini camper van, you could do that too. I also just want to thank Chiro at Petrol Hedonism Underground. We hear a Lamborghini fire up in the, <laughs> in the background, background behind me um, for allowing us to come down with the van this weekend and record with so many amazing guests. Connor, thank you for coming on Road to Success. You've been fantastic. And I look forward to seeing you too and wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.